Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces today. Fascinating stories. First up, veteran trader who predicted Bitcoin rise to $100,000 issues a painful update to cryptocurrency investors. Also, another ETF is rejected by the SEC, and this is the response from Wilshire Phoenix, which is the company that uh, originally filed the ETF and what they have to say. And we're going to take a look at a very troublesome maybe troublesome, interesting comment that Brad Garlinghouse said, which was Ripple would not be profitable without selling XRP. Did he say that or not? And finally, we're going to go over the scam of the day, and we'll go over that at the very last part of this video. But let's get into today's stories. So first up, price predictions. Everybody loves those, even though they've usually proven to be wrong. But there is one guy that I do listen to, and that is Peter Brandt. Peter Brandt, if you don't know, he's one of those legendary traders that gets a lot of things right. He's been in the game for decades. He has a whole team around him to help him out. And he's made a lot of the right predictions. He was one of the very few people that called for Bitcoin to crash multiple times after 2017. When everybody was on the high horse going, this is going to go to the moon and it'll never stop. He was one who's like, look, it's going to crash here. And then he also predicted two more crashes after that. So when this gentleman talks, I tend to listen. So first up, veteran technical trader who was immortalized in the world of crypto for calling the top of Bitcoin's last parabolic cycle, parabolic cycle, updating his views on Bitcoin. He states, Bitcoin takes aim at a $100,000 target. Bitcoin USD is experiencing its fourth parabolic phase dating back to 2010. No other market in my 45 years of trading has gone parabolic on a log chart in this manner. Bitcoin is a market like no other. And of course, for for us as investors, we look at this and we're always like, great, there's another you know, person who is in this space who knows exactly what he's talking about and he's behind us. However, don't get too hot too fast. As its price continued to rise in February, he said Bitcoin's strong start to the year suggests an even larger moonshot could play out through 2021. Since then, Bitcoin aggressively retraced from a high of 10421 on February 12th to its current price of, a, of around $8,600. And that is a big hit to take. But remember, uh, if you're new to this space, this must be like the worst thing ever. But remember, in cryptocurrency digital assets, it is not uncommon to see 10, 20, 30% swings in a day, in five hours. It just happens. So you have to be prepared. And this is what we are actually getting into. So moving on. He states on February 28th, he says, I am constructive on Bitcoin, but let's look at the facts. Bitcoin has been a bear market for 26 months, not exactly a bull trend. In September, Brandt posted a chart showing what it would look like if Bitcoin has in fact started a new rally that mirrors its previous parabolic bull run. And according to the chart, Bitcoin will have to rise 67% and hit around 14.5 this summer to stay in line with previous rallies. And um, I believe that during the Bitcoin halving, when it starts to come up um, around May 20, 2020, we're going to see a, t a type of price that's going to be around 10,000. Some people say it's going to be 12,000. Some people say it's going to be 8,000. I got it around 10,000, 11,000 if everything history is accurate. And with Peter Brandt, he's saying, look, if we are going to hit this parabolic run, we need to get up to 14.5 in this summer to actually go to those highs of 100,000. So we will see. Brand says traders should always keep an open mind, preparing to be nimble and show a willingness to change course to make it in the markets. And his last quote is this. I receive a ton of criticism, sarcasm and trolling because I changed my mind on markets. Just to let you trolls know, I take my willingness and ability to change my mind quickly as a point of survival and pride as a trader. So that is what he's, what he's talking about. That is what he's saying. What do you believe is going to happen as far as Bitcoin? Is it going to go to zero? Is it going to go to a million dollars? Let me know in the comments section below. I just like to hear what people who are in authority and actually have done this before have to say about this. I personally believe that $100,000 is the minimum for Bitcoin, especially with all the institutional investors uh, coming in, and especially after this coronavirus uh, scare dies down. Moving on. Yet again, another ETF is rejected by our friends in the SEC, and Wilshire Phoenix talks about it in this article. So, Wilshire Phoenix filed an ETF proposal in January 2019, and it was rejected 
Yet again, the firm stated it was very disappointed by the SEC's ruling and went to great lengths to comply with the regulatory body's expectations. And, and this is the same type of thing I've been hearing over and over and over again, is that these institutions will file an ETF, the SEC will come back at them and say, you, you need to tweak this, you need to do this, you need to give us this data. And they comply all the way down the line, and at the very end, they just pull the rug out from underneath them and they're like, ha! Sorry, suckers. We're not going to prove this. We were just kidding. JK. So I find it um, disconcerting that this happened, um, but I will be honest with you. I did a video about a month ago, and it was a it was a blast from the past. It was Roger Veer, and he was talking in 2012 about how great Bitcoin was and how uh, he believed, and a lot of people also believed, that uh, ETFs would have to come in for Bitcoin to push it to the moon. And uh, look what happened. We didn't need the ETFs. We didn't need that stuff to roll in. It just didn't happen. But it's the same narrative year after year after year. We have to get these ETFs. And God bless them. Everybody keeps trying and, you know, good for you. But look, the SEC, with its current management and uh, participation that is going on with the board members, it is not going to happen. Those people will never approve an ETF. I don't care what is done. There is one ray of hope, and I'm going to get to that at the very end, but as it currently stands, not a chance in hell. Moving on. The investment firm made six amendments to its original application over the course of 13 months before having its ETF proposal outright rejected on Feb 26. SEC cited the potential for market manipulation, which is the same thing it talks about every single time. Market manipulation, market manipulation. And it's just BS. I mean, there is market manipulation, but we're going to get into the, the caveat as to why they're actually going against their own recommendation. And concerns related to investor protection as their primary reason for denying the proposal. Wilshire Phoenix issued a response and stated, We made every effort to get the SEC's attention on this important issue, including undertaking extensive analysis that was made available to the SEC staff, submitting key data, and offering to provide additional info to facilitate the listing of a much-needed regulated Bitcoin-related ETP in the U.S. Unfortunately, the order shows that all these efforts did not receive the SEC's full attention. William Herman, Managing Director for Wilshire Phoenix, argued that the SEC is potentially harming investors by denying regulated products such as ETFs and he's right if you cannot get regulation into this space what's going to happen there's going to be multiple man manipulation multiple whales kind of pushing things around you can't get the markets to be uh, liquid as much as it should be and it's going to screw people over as time goes on I am I've been calling for regulation since I started this channel and it kind of makes me very angry that the SEC just poo poos and just kind of shoes it away even with all these different companies coming in and going, what do you want? We'll do that. We'll, we'll make this happen. You want more data? No problem. We can do this. We can do this. And, it's, and it just keeps going on and on and on. And then the SEC's like, huh, sorry, not going to do it anyhow. So I don't even know why they even ask. Moving on, it says many, he states, many retail investors are already investing in this, in this commodity and investor demand continues to grow each day. Our ATP was created to provide investors with exposure to Bitcoin through a regulated and transparent vehicle that also mitigates volatility. He states, finally, in my opinion, the commission has done a great disservice to the public by rejecting this application. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, let me know what you think. Do you think there's ever going to be an ETF actually that will actually be pulled through with the current state of the SEC? Or do you think it's just going to be the same old rigmarole and tap dance, song and dance for here until eternity? Let me know in the comments. But I can tell you this. For me, there's one beacon of light, and that beacon is Hester Pierce. Who's Hester Pierce? So Hester Pierce is an American lawyer specializing in financial market regulation, and she currently serves as a commissioner on the SEC. And she uh, previously served as the director of the Financial Market Serv Working Services. So I dug this up. This was Hester Pierce's dissenting statement to this ETP that was just rejected. And it was interesting to state that there's fine, there's somebody on this SEC panel that gets it. Uh, Hester Pierce, you can also, she's also known as Crypto Mom because she is one of those people that has been a uh, proponent for cryptocurrency digital assets. And it's just refreshing to see, like, hey, should, for her to call the SEC 
and the big boys club on their BS. Like, listen, you're not doing what you say you're supposed to do, and you're going against your own rules. Here's what she says. Today, the commission once again disapproved a proposed rule change that would give American investors access to Bitcoin through a product listed and traded on a national securities exchange subject to the commission's regulatory framework. This line of disapprovals leads me to conclude that this commission is unwilling to approve the listing of any product that would provide access to the market for Bitcoin and that no filing will meet the ever-shifting standards that this commission insists on applying to Bitcoin-related products and only to Bitcoin-related products. I warned that the commission's hesitancy to embrace new products and technologies impedes innovation in this country and threatens to drive entrepreneurs and the opportunities they create to other jurisdictions. Meanwhile, investor interest is gaining exposure to Bitcoin continues to grow. And here's where she calls them out on their BS. She says, look, in Section 6B5 of the Exchange Act requires in part that the rules of a national securities exchange be designed to prevent fraudulent and manipulative acts and practices and to protect investors and the public interest. As I explained in the Winklevoss dissent, this provision requires the commission to look to the rules of the exchange seeking to list the product, not the attributes of the assets or markets underlying the products to be traded. The statute says nothing about the underlying markets. Basically, she's saying you're a bunch of hypocrites and you needed to do your job and you failed miserably. So uh, I applaud you, Hester Pierce, wherever you are at right now. So thank you so much for being a voice of reason. And I believe at some point, if she ever ascends to the throne, which I hope she does, then ETF will be approved just like that. Moving on. Last piece. Ripple would not be profitable without selling XRP, says CEO Brad Garlinghouse. Maybe, maybe not. This was a quick article from The Block. And uh, part of the problems with some of these articles is that they, they are slanted to the view of the person who is writing it, even though they try to become non-objective. And I will just uh, be honest with you. I'm biased, too, because here's what I've invested in. Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Cardano, EOS, and Chainlink. So when I'm talking about these uh, different projects, you can understand that I, even though if I'm trying not to be biased, I am still biased. That is just the truth. But I try to break it down to the simplest levels possible and not be as biased as I possibly can be. So let's get into this. So Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse has indicated that XRP sales form a significant chunk, chunk, chunk of the company's profitability. Totally true. No one can deny that. They sell a lot of it. They put it out there. Uh, they don't sell as much to the retail investors as... Uh, what they're looking to do as far as uh, exchanges and institutional investors. So we'll see how that works out later on. But he states, we would not be profitable or cash flow positive without selling XRP. Garlinghouse was quoted as saying in a Financial Times report published Friday. And uh, the rest of the port, I mean, the rest of the document's pretty short uh, for the actual article. So you have to get context. Well, first of all, there's these little brackets right here without selling XRP. So do you know what that means when you have a quote and then you have brackets in there? It's not a direct quote. It is the author of this article or any article who is interpreting the message that is being conveyed by the person who is being quoted. It is not a direct quote. So this could be really anything. And I think to really dig down into it, we have to look at the original article, which is right here in the Financial Times. So this comes from February 28th by Isabella Kaminska, and it talks about the art of redefining success, MoneyGram and Ripple edition, updated. So this is a little bit longer, and because a lot of information has to be a little bit longer at times, because we have to get the context of what was actually being said and will be said. So let's start off. For all its talk about imminently disrupting cross-border payments, Ripple Labs, the cryptocurrency startup that likes to make out its in with the mainstream banking boys, has had very little to show for its efforts in terms of real-world applications or relationships. So right here, we're starting off on that a great foot. Um, now remember, I'm a little biased, but I will tell you this. As far as like partnerships and who they have 
um, you know, come into contact with and sign on the dotted lines. And that's not to mention all the non-disclosure agreements that have maybe been signed. I can't speak to that. But I can tell you that there have been a lot of partnerships come about, over 200, right? Now, there's a big difference between using Ripple and using XRP. Ripple is a software company. XRP is a cryptocurrency. And we're going to get into why that is so important a little bit later. But in this article, it states there are two exceptions to what she just talked about. One is a big partnership with Santander Bank. The next one was with MoneyGram. And those are the two big ones, and uh, I can't disagree with that. That is true. Moving on. Walking into this deal, which completed in 2019, MoneyGram wasn't in the fittest of states. And when you look at this is the stock price for MoneyGram, you can see what kind of a downward slide they were on all the way back from 2010, 2011. I mean, you had a nice, healthy stock right here around $30. Now look at these dips though. Almost looks like cryptocurrency for Pete's sakes. I mean, you got, you're down here to around $15 and it doubled to 30 and it drops all the way down to below 15. And then you just see like this downward trend. And then all of a sudden, a little spike here, something good happened. And then down, it just plummeted. I mean, really plummeted. So when Ripple was talking to MoneyGram, they were talking to him around the end of 2018. And then when their partnership came about in 2019, then there was a bump and a little bit down. But I can just tell you right now from experience, I've had businesses that just did not work. And when you start to do like a downward spiral, you have to do something major. And a lot of the times, you don't recover. It's just like a plane crash. You're trying to divert this crash, but it's just doom to doom to doom. So I don't know what MoneyGram was doing, why it was losing out. I can't speak to it before that. I can just tell you that in 2019, towards the end, that's when the Ripple MoneyGram partnership, and they started to do a little bit of an uptake, but there was still some losses, and that's how it goes in business. And to be quite honest, as far as like losses go, it kind of reminds me of Tesla. I mean, Tesla, as you can see, didn't really do much at all. 2012, 2011, wasn't really nothing going on there. Then a little bit of bumps, then dips, then dips and bumps, and then a little bit of up here and then down here. The thing is with Tesla and with MoneyGram, I don't know what was going on, but I can just tell you like here, around 2019, there was an earnings report that came out and they didn't make as much earnings so that so the stock dropped. And all of a sudden we remember this parabolic run up. And just like technology, Tesla to me is a, is a technology company. It's not a car company. Its basis is in technology and it's, and it's leading the pack for all different types of things due to technology. And as opposed to like a Ford, which is stuck in, you know, decades past. The same thing is going on, I believe, with MoneyGram. They were stuck in the past doing the way that, you know, things they've always done, and they've adopted this new type of technology, and it's going to take a little bit of time. I think it's a good move, but who knows what's going to happen. But I can tell you this, when they went down, man, they plummet fast. Anyhow, moving on. But come November 2019, MoneyGram's chairman and CEO, Alex Holmes, declared that up to 10% of MoneyGram's U.S.-Mexico business was already being handled by Ripple Systems. So 10% of all the money that goes from U.S. to Mexico was being handled by Ripple, and not just Ripple Systems, but mind you, it's XRP. So what a great deal, or somebody would have thought. But it turns out that Ripple has been paying a significant amount of cash to MoneyGram's business since buying into the company in June. In the third and fourth quarter alone, the Ripple benefits amounted to $11.3 million. So what Ripple did is they came in there and they said, look, we want to buy a part of your company. We want to buy stock into it. We believe we can have a great partnership and we can do great things over years. Right now, we know you're struggling. So let's put money in. You can use XRP. You can make these things happen. It's faster. It's cheaper. It gives you on-demand liquidity so you don't have to pre-fund all these different bank accounts. We can pull that money back. We can invest it back in the company and everybody wins. Do you want to try it? And the CEO is like, eh, maybe we'll see what happens. And he's been ecstatic ever since. Uh, there's been a different uh, interviews and things where he talks about, look, the only hindrance that we have with XRP right now is the other banks aren't using it as much as we'd like them to. We need people to bring into XRP. We need this thing to happen so we can have more liquidity, just faster and cheaper. And I believe Ripple's doing a pretty good job because what they're doing is they're going out there and going, uh, look, banks, I know you don't really like cryptocurrency, and that's cool because you've heard how awful it is and different regulations, but uh, we can just use our software and just try it out there. Now, 
later on, six months on the road, a year down the road, Ripple might say, hey, look, uh, if you like you know, Ripple Labs and, and the Ledger, why don't we use XRP? It's faster, it's less expensive, and it gives you the liquidity you know, to pre-fund everything. You wanna give it a shot? And there we go. We'll see what happens, just my two cents. Moving on, this is where it gets interesting. What's more, in teleconsultation with the SEC, MoneyGram has been more than happy to book these cash flows as revenues. Just the way they say it, it's a little bit uh, off, but whatever. Due to the SEC guidance, however, it has now had to restate fourth quarter guidance to account for Ripple payments as contra expenses. So what MoneyGram was doing was, was Ripple was paying them money to help them offset some of their costs for the technology to build the rails to help them out with like building infrastructure because they knew what's going to happen later down the road. It's going to be beneficial. And uh, they, MoneyGram, sat down with the SEC. The SEC did not pull them into court or something like, hey, you got to do this. They sat down with the SEC and go, we, we need a little guidance here. What should we do? Can we say it as, as, as expense or as uh, revenue? They said, no. You're going to put this as a contra expenses, different type of uh, accounting uh, term. They said, fine, we'll do whatever you guys want to do. And uh, so now they couldn't say that as revenue, which would have kind of equaled out to their Q4 earnings. Uh, so instead of showing like, you know, kind of breaking even, whereas they've been showing losses and losses and losses, now they show a little bit more losses than they would have because of the money from Ripple, whatever. Just a way to offset different things. So moving on. This article talks about a white paper issued in 2016 made the case that banks could achieve major cost and capital savings by using XRP and payment flows. The system aims to generate liquidity by inviting market makers to trade around the continuous arbitrage opportunities created by flows in and out of XRP relative to the price of other foreign currencies. And so they're saying that the reason XRP works so well uh, is because of it generates liquidity. True. And the way it generates liquidity is for arbitrage uh, flows in and out of XRP related to the price of other foreign currencies, uh, an, an arbitrage opportunity. And that's really not it. I mean, it may be, but from my understanding of uh, Ripple and or XRP, uh, what's great about that is every bank who does cross border payments, if you want to send money to Thailand, uh, or, or let's just do with Mexico, right? You have to pre-fund all the different bank accounts that you have with pesos. And when they transfer money over, it just gets converted. So if you have to do that throughout the entire globe, you have to do that for the, all the different currencies in the world. You have to let it sit there. Doesn't matter if the money depreciates or appreciates. Usually it's gonna depreciate because of inflation. And uh, you're gonna get stuck with a lot of money just sitting there doing absolutely nothing for you. So as a cross-border payment company, that kind of sucks. However, with XRP, you don't have to do that. There is no pre-payments pre, uh, uh, pre for these Nostro Vostro accounts. You just use XRP, settled in three seconds, done, everybody's happy. So that's the true liquidity uh, as I see it. Moving on, but getting institutions to adopt the cryptocurrency dependent system has been no easy task. For compliance and regulatory reasons, banks are naturally cautious of getting involved with untraceable cryptocurrencies. So this is a problem for banks. They don't want to be caught uh, money laundering like Wells Fargo <laughs> recently did for money laundering the Sinaloa cartel's money. So when people are, just, or just a little caveat, when people are talking about how awful cryptocurrency is for like money laundering, just remind them, you know, as of like 10 years ago when Bitcoin came out, before that, all money laundering was all done with the US dollar. So don't talk to me about there's all this money laundering being done by Monero and Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum. That's BS. It's mostly by US dollar and everybody knows it. So moving on, it says to get around these constraints, Ripple started trying to sell software to banks that acted as a bi-directional messaging system akin to Swift that had no dependency on cryptocurrency anywhere. So it's a, it's a beautiful move. We call this in sales a tripwire. You you lay out something that is not as like your flagship product. You say, "Look, um, we've got this product. It's, it's uh, you know, it's called Ripple. It's our um, you know Ripple Ledger, and uh, you can use that. And it's uh, it works pretty well as far as like a messaging system, just like Swift. And you know, it's not as expensive as Swift. Okay, we'll try that. And then once you get your foot in the door, you know, six months, a year, two years, then you're like, "Hey, bank, just like I talked about." 
you already know Ripple. You know already know how stable we are. We've been around for a while. We've proven ourselves. Um, we also have this product. It's called XRP. We can give it a trial. You know, if to go live right now, we'll trial it out, and you can see if you're going to save money or not, and if you can, you know, save a lot of things as far as liquidity goes. It's faster. It's cheaper, and it's li it's liquid. You don't have to pre-fund anything. Okay, we'll give it a shot. But you have to get your foot in the door. Nobody trusts somebody they don't know. You have to get in there first. Give them a tripwire, let them go over that, and then hit them with the big product. Moving on. At, this is the crux of this of the article. Asked if XRP was keeping everything cash flow positive at Ripple Labs, Mr. Goinghouse answered, well, XRP is one source. I don't know how to answer that because if you took away our software revenues, that would make us less profitable. If you took away all of our XRP, that makes us also less profitable. So I don't think about it as one thing. And that's true. I mean, if you have different assets or different products and services, why would you just say, well, just get rid of this thing and you'll be okay? Well, but why would I get rid of that thing? And would we be profitable without it? Well, we'd be less profitable. Um, maybe Ripple could stand by itself. Uh, it doesn't really say exactly in here because in his next statement, he says, we would not be profitable or cash flow positive. And that's all he said. This part here about without selling XRP, that's just an interpretation. So he could have said that. I'm not saying he didn't or that wasn't the, the intent. I'm just saying that this quote is not 100% perfect from the person who said it. It is an interpretation by the author. And uh, the only thing that we can say for sure is he said we would not be profitable or cash flow positive. Does that mean that he wasn't profitable or cash flow positive without Ripple? without XRP, without a certain segment of his other company or other parts of the company? What was the actual reason he talking about? And the other party says is, I think I've said that. We have now, whatever the heck, that doesn't make any sense, but okay. So this is gonna be a bigger story as time goes on. And he's gonna be asked about this about a million times. So as time goes on, we'll see exactly what he says. And hopefully he clarifies it, which I'm pretty sure he's going to have to, especially after this article. And I will be listening and you know, hey, uh, if that's what it is, that's what it is, but uh, we have to stick with the facts and what we know. So that's it. So hey, thanks for listening to all the rants. I really appreciate it. That's going to do it for today's video. If you got time, stick around. We're going to go over the scam of the day so we can get rid of these uh, dirty scammers, and we'll do that right now. So first up, the scam of the day. If you're new, welcome. Um, if you're new to cryptocurrency, welcome. I will tell you this, to avoid scams, it's pretty simple. Treat everything like it's a scam until proven otherwise. Because everything's out there, 99.9% .9 of things are scams. Very few are not. So if you're ever in doubt, if you ever think Ripple's giving away money, or Ripple's giving away XRP, then shoot them an email to the official website and say, hey, are you guys doing an XRP uh, giveaway? If you think Binance is giving away free Ethereum, send, it, send an email to the official website. Same thing with Coinbase, with Kraken, with Gemini, with uh, Ledger. If you think anything is free, first of all, it's not. But if you still are stubborn and need to check, go to the official website, drop them an email. It usually takes about 24 hours to them answer you, and uh, you won't lose all your money. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we have to clean up this environment that we're in because it's toxic with all these scammers trying to scam out people who aren't as smart as you who are listening to this video. So what we do is we put together Scam of the Day. And in the uh, description of every one of my videos, it's gonna be a link. And it's, at first it's gonna say Scam of the Day. And that link, you're just gonna click on that and it's gonna take you to this handy dandy uh, Google spreadsheet. And we've done pretty good. I mean, we just started this uh, middle of January. I've gone about a month and a half, so we wiped out a ton. So thanks everybody who's helped me out. Really appreciate it. Uh, but here's the three that we have today. Actually, we had four. And before I checked the video, I checked on the fourth one, and that was already wiped away without me even having to do anything. So people are automatically checking this. That's awesome. So we've got three today. Not a big deal. Super easy to take care of. So we're going to click on this link. It's going to take us to... Ooh, something like this. And this is a video, a legit video of, you know, that's Elon Musk talking about whatever the hell he's talking about. So this doesn't look like a big thing. And we're like, okay, well, first, let's take a look at the comment section. That kind of tells us where we're at as far as if it's, <laughs> if it's a scam. Here's one mullet. Stop scamming. Fantastic channel. More please. Let's do YouTube partners. That's a scam. 
Um, so some of it looks like a scam, some of it might not. So how do we know it's a scam? What we're looking for is an asymmetrical giveaway. So in this video, which is, it looks like it's 11 hours. Is that right? A long time. Um, whatever he's talking about is fine, but usually in the description, it's gonna say something like, hey, we're doing a giveaway. Um, and it says here, if you wanna participate in liquidation of our Bitcoin wallet, it's really simple to do. Just go to muskbtc.com. Let's take a look at that. And uh, nice website. I gotta give it to them. Nice, very nice. Good job. Uh, unfortunately, it's a scam. So the, th the thing with this is, it's saying right here, to verify your address, just send us 0.1 to 10 Bitcoin, and we'll give you a double back, 0.2 to 20 Bitcoin. And all you gotta do is just copy this address and send us uh, a Bitcoin. So some people who are new to this be like, wow, is that how cryptocurrency works? I have no idea. I never even heard about it, so sure. And they get scammed and screwed out of their money. So what we're gonna do, very simply, is we're gonna go here and we're going to dislike it. Very simple. Then we're gonna click on these three dots right here and we're gonna report it. And in the report, we're gonna say, what is this? Spam or misleading? Choose one, it's spam or scam. And then this applies to links within the video description. We click on that and click next. And all we say is, hey, this is a scam. And report and we're done. So that's all you gotta do. Um, to report these types of scams and that's it so if you could do that be very thankful people in the community will thank you thank you thank you thank you and that's it for today's video all together so thanks for sticking with me to the very end if you like these types of videos there's gonna be two more that are gonna pop up and uh, I don't know what they are they're gonna be curated for your viewing pleasure by YouTube so check them out and uh, that's it I'll see you on the next one